Uh, thank you. A little, uh, I'm not so formal today. I apologize for that. We're going to vacuum at nine, so I should help uh, with this recording. Uh, we left off last week really talking about what we're giving up to Our Lady. We talked about the, the merits and the uh, satisfactory benefits of what we're giving up. And we find that we're really giving up everything. Like we're basically have nothing else left to give. And it's more demanding <clears throat> than even uh, what a religious order does, you know. And so now we're going to move on and talk about, and we found out that we can still pray for people. Like if we pray a rosary, I wanted to follow up kind of with an example. When we pray the rosary, there's um, meritorious value. So we, St. Louis de Montfort says in the secret of the rosary, that we, um, can you still hear me? Yep. Um, okay, great. St. Louis de Montfort says we get a, we give Our Lady a crown of roses every time we pray a rosary. We also store up treasure for ourselves. So we get meritorious act of value and we get to, we, that's preserved our lady um, we also can offer that rosary up in reparation and that's the satisfactory uh, dimension we can remit uh, we give that entirely to our lady to do whatever she wants with to um pay debts um from temporal punishment um but we also after that can still offer that um to our lady even though we've given it up, she's more pleased that we've given it to her. And, and it's like we said before, because we've given it to, entirely to her, we can ask her and say, hey, uh, from what I gave you, uh, can I still, uh, can we apply it to so-and-so? We can still pray for that. And so, in fact, it's more pleasing. Um, we're more pleasing to Our Lady after that. <clears throat> Um, he also talks about renewing our baptism. When we do the consecration, um, we are simply uh, renewing our baptism, uh, baptismal vows. We're going back to what it means to be a Catholic. And um, in the catechism, the Roman catechism uh, from the Council of Trent, that's what one of the biggest things that the Council of Fathers wanted us to do was get back to our baptismal vows. And so um, there's a quote I'd like to read from the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It says, the parish priest shall exhort the faithful people so that they may know that it is most just that we should devote and consecrate ourselves forever to our Redeemer and Lord as his very slaves. Um, and so um, when we, when we, uh, when we make the consecration, we're simply getting back to um, our baptism of vows. That's why um, I don't have it in front of me. Um, when you make the consecration, it's on page 169, I believe. Let me double check. No, page 196 of this blue book. Um, you can look at it with me. It says... Um, that I have not kept the promises which I made so solemnly to thee in my baptism. I have not fulfilled my obligations. And so he's trying to locate or place this consecration in the context of our baptism of vows. And so we get it, we get back to what it means to be a Catholic, and we get back to what it means for our lady to be our mother. There's some objections. Uh, to this consecration that St. Louis de Montfort um, uh, addresses. One is, this consecration sounds new. He was writing in the 1600s. He, he overcomes that objection by saying that the very first discussion of the consecration and true devotion goes back to 1680. The consecration is very old. And St. Louis de Montfort is a historian on the consecration. He's kind of a doctor of the church. He's not defined a doctor, but he definitely um, 
did all the research and found that we've been doing this for a very long time. So we can rest assured. I'm not going to go through the whole history, but he says, Blessed Marino in 1016 AD spoke about being a slave of Our Lady and about having true devotion to her and giving her everything. And it goes on and on. And he basically is consolidating it and perfecting it in his day. Another objection is if I give everything to Our Lady, I'm going to, my friends and family won't have anything else. They won't be able to benefit from our prayers. And as we saw um, from before, Our Lady is more pleased. Jesus is more pleased if we give everything um, where we can go back and say, can we use a little bit of that that I gave you for so-and-so? Uh, it's ridiculous um, and very superficial and a cheap view of the generosity of Our Lady to think that if I've given her everything, um, she's not going to want to listen to our prayers. Same with purgatory. Um, what about me? You know, if I if I give up all the satisfactory merits of my prayers and penance, then I'm going to go to purgatory. <laughs> That's another objection. Do you think Our Lady is going to let you go to purgatory because you've given up all the satisfactory merits? Um, I guess everybody here is going to benefit uh, from this <laughs> um, discussion about Our Lady. Do you think Our Lady, honestly, would leave you an orphan in purgatory? If you've given her everything, you've given her more than what even religious, when they take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, sometimes a vow, as I said before, of obedience to the Holy Father. If you're a Jesuit, or if you're, if you were, a Franciscan friar of the Immaculate. I'm so jealous of this. The Pope got rid of this vow. Did you, did you hear? Did you hear about the vow that the Franciscan friars of the Immaculate used to make? It's a vow. Anybody hear that before? No. No? It's a vow of unlimited consecration. So it's what we're doing, but it's at the level of a vow. That's what they did. The Pope Francis and the Vatican got rid of that vow. They destroyed it. And so the St. Maximilian Kolbe had this dream when he was alive in Japan um, of this vow of unlimited consecration to Our Lady. He never got to make this vow. The Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, when they were started um, by um, two very holy Franciscans, one of them was a spiritual son of St. Padre Pio, they got to take this vow. The, the chaplain of the sisters in in, in uh, Pennsylvania, the Carmelites, for the Maximilian Dean, got to take that vow. For him, that vow still holds because he's already made it. It's a vow of unlimited consecration. What it means is that um, it's like what we're doing, but but we're not doing this under pain of sin. If we if we don't if we hold back. Um, to Our Lady, and we hold back some satisfactory merits. We're just not living up to the promise, but we're not committing us any sin. But if you make a vow of unlimited consecration to Our Lady, then you kind of become the husband, like St. Joseph of Our Lady, and it becomes binding under pain of sin. And also, it's a vow of unlimited apostolate, of promoting devotion for them, every waking breath, Everything they do, every ounce of their being is dedicated to promoting uh, devotion to Our Lady. We're kind of living that out as a promise you know, in the consecration, but it doesn't take the status of a vow. So um, Our Lady won't abandon us or orphan us to purgatory if we've given us, if we give her all of our plenary indulgences. Just I just give them uh, to Our Lady. Uh, she, she's not going to outdo us in generosity. It's not like that. Um, I want to talk about now um, the motives. There's eight motives in true devotion in this book that St. Louis de Montfort talks about. And basically, that's what I'm going to discuss with you today. I don't know if this will take the full time or not, but um, there's one really awesome um, 
a thing that I want to share with you today. If that's the only thing value you get out of this talk, then um, uh, then all you can do is bow before the mystery of who our lady is um, when you think about it. Um, first of all, um, the first motive is um, that, that when we make the consecration, we'll better serve God. Um, because we're giving everything to uh, Our Lady, to Jesus, um, through Our Lady. If we read page, paragraph 136, I'll read that and then it'll kind of be the springboard uh, for analyzing that. Um, it's kind of like what I've already said, like, so you have different confraternities, different groups, different things that you can do to serve our Lord. Even in the confraternity of Our Lady of Fatima, only giving, making five little promises um, in there. But um, when you make the consecration, you're doing this, the true devotion. This devotion makes us give to Jesus and Mary without reserve all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our actions and sufferings, every moment of our life in such wise that whether we wake or sleep, whether we eat or drink, whether we do great actions or very little ones, it is always true to say that whatever we do, even without thinking of it, we can take great consolation to this because many times we don't feel it. We don't feel close to Our Lady. She's not giving us candies. She's not giving us the little happy joys. She's leaving us to grow deeper in our faith. It's by virtue of our offering, at least if it has not been intentionally retracted, it's done for Jesus and Mary. So when you make the consecration in 11 days, I'll be renewing it. Many of you are renewing it. If you haven't retracted it, then it's still in force. The decision is still in effect. And so we take great joy in that because we're very limited creatures. We can barely pay attention at all to anything. And so thank God, um, our, the power of our consecration doesn't depend upon us pay, paying attention to it. Once we've done it, it's, ir it's as long as we haven't retracted it, it's irrevocable. And so that means that that's like a blanket. So when I ride um, the eagle today with my children, that can be, uh, it can be an act of consecration to Our Lady. Like it could be something in her honor. I'll be just be like scared and happy to be alive when I'm done. And hopefully my neck, won't, I won't need a chiropractor when I'm done, but it can be an act of Our Lady or the hike tomorrow, whatever we do, um, can be that for her, all of her thoughts. Um, so we take great consolation on that. Um, so if that is true, then um, everything we can do can be in better service of our Lord and, and Mary. The second motive um, is make, it makes us better imitate Jesus. Um, all Christians, uh, whether the Catholic or the Protestants, want us to imitate Jesus. But if we do the consecration, we're better imitating Jesus. And what St. Louis de Montfort says is that um, he spent the babe greater part of his life, not 10 years, he says, not 12 years, not 16 years, but 30 years in consecration to Our Lady. He spent 30 hidden years in submission to her, doing what she wants, um, being under her. We don't know what that was like, but we know this, that if it were better, Jesus would have done it. If it were better for Jesus to have had four or five years of, of his ministry, he would have done it. But it was more perfect that he that he spent 30 years in consecration to Our Lady. That was the perfect way, because if he would have done it, if there was a better way to do it, he would have already done it that way. But he chose to live this consecration to Our Lady, this submission. We see this submission when he uh, 
disobeyed his parents and left the temple. Obviously, already very much um, a great teacher. The, 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 the elders in the temple were marveled at his wisdom. So he knew full well what he's doing, but he submitted uh, himself to them. And he submitted him all the way uh, for 30 years. And so there's no better way uh, to imitate Jesus in the, in the consecration. Uh, and then doing the consecration, it says, um, let me see if I got a quote for you. Um, um, yeah, I don't have a really have a quote for you on that one. Um, and he, he kind of repeats in the second motive how each of the blessed persons of the Trinity have submitted themselves and only act through her. I don't want to belabor that point, but that is one of the highest um, views of Our Lady, which is not, I'll recall it to your mind, that each person of the Blessed Trinity has submitted themselves to her. Um, the Father um, chose to only uh, work his plan of redemption through Our Lady. He could have done it any other way, but he chose only to act through her. The Son only decided to, to be a co-redeemer, the co-redemptrix with her. Um, he only chose to work through her, starting at the wedding feast of Cana. And when the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, he never left. He's always the shadow of Our Lady, the spouse. St. Maximilian Colby speaks of them as, this is powerful. I don't know if you heard this before. Um, Pardon me if you have, but St. Maximilian Colby could have been a great doctor of Marian theology, but he was too busy in the apostolate in Japan and then laying down his life. But he spoke of Our Lady as the created Immaculate Conception. And he spoke about the Holy Ghost as the uncreated Immaculate Conception. So for him, they are so united with their wills that they are both one immaculate conception. That's how powerful and beautiful Our Lady is. But why is that? Because the Holy Ghost chooses, once he united her, himself to her, he chose to become an immaculate or invite her into his immaculate conception and only act through her. And um, so, um, that's the second motive, um, is that each person of the Blessed Trinity um, only acts with and through her by their choice. And so um, what better way can we be like Jesus and imitate him than by uh, making the consecration to her and submitting everything to her? Um, this next one is the singer, though, or the one that is hitting me in a new way. And it comes um, from Jesus when he gave Our Lady as our mother at the foot of the cross. Um, if we read um, paragraph 144, what will Our Lady do if we give ourselves entirely to Our Lady? What will she give us? She will give us herself. And that's a better deal. We're giving our poor, sinful fragile, weak selves. We know we know full well who we are. We know our weaknesses. We know our attachments. We know our venial sins. We know where we're weak. We know we know of the seven deadly sins. We know where, where we're weakest. We give up. We know that we have the dust of the world on ourselves. And when we give it to Our Lady, we see the dust when we give it to her. But what does she give us in return? She gives us herself. It's, it's just crazy. It's a, I want to read this quote from you in paragraph 144. She also gives her whole self and gives it in an unspeakable manner to give to him who gives all to her. She causes him to be engulfed in the abyss of her graces. She adorns him with her merits. So we get her virtues. We get her merits. What is she, my gosh, what does she merit before God? Like if we, if God gave us the power to merit, as we learned from the Council of 
trend last time. Like we could truly merit heaven and God's amazing generosity after the first grace that is given that we don't merit. Um, that we learned last time because that merit only comes from Jesus. Once that merit comes from Jesus, then we are, give the, are given the power to merit heaven because of God's generosity, pure and simple. That's how we can work out our salvation. Um, think about Our Lady's merit, my gosh. She who never committed sin, who's always pleasing in his sight. Think of what that merit means. I can't even, our minds can't even fathom that merit. She's giving us some of her merit to us. I can't even, uh, I could just meditate on all day and, and try to even understand what that means. That deserves a whole book in itself. The merit, what Our Lady merits before God as the Immaculate One, as the Immaculate Conception. She gives us some of that. She also, so we don't want to miss out on what that word, on that word means. She gives us her merits. She supports him with her power. What power does she have? God's power. She has the kingdom of God. The angels are her servants and slaves. We are her servants and slaves. She governs with God's almighty power because God gives it to her. She illuminates with her light. She inflames him with her love. We're given her love inside of us. She communicates to him her virtues. You think of that. We know what our weaknesses are, but she shares with us her virtues in some mystical way. She gives us her humility, her faith, her purity, all of them. She makes herself his bail, his supplement, his dear all toward Jesus. In a word, as that consecrated person is all Mary's, so Mary is all his. It's like that. After such a fashion that we can say of that perfect servant and child of Mary, was St. John, the evangelist said of himself in John chapter 19, verse 27, the disciple took her for his own. Think about that one all day long. The disciple took Our Lady as his own. That's what, after um, when Jesus gave Mary to us as the woman, as the mother to all disciples, everybody that's cat baptized Catholic or has a valid baptism, once that happens, she becomes your mother. And when you consecrate yourself to her, you're giving you everything that you are. In like white manner, instantaneously, she's giving everything that she is without holding back, without reservation. She's giving everything that she is. And now, like St. John, at the foot of the cross, we take her home with us. And she becomes ours, our own, our own. Her, her mother, not just, um, that's um, what happens in the consecration. That's what it means. Um, uh, that's, that's the deal. Like we're getting a way better deal. We're giving her frail humanity and she's giving her perfect um, immaculate humanity. And um, that in itself is uh, another motive of doing the consecration. Um, there's so many of them. Um, that's probably the greatest thing I'll probably say today. Um, the fourth motive of this consecration is that um, we will give God the greatest glory um, if we do this consecration. Had we not done it, St. Ignatius of Loyola has that famous saying, ad majorum de gloriam for the greater glory of God. St. Saint, Saint, um, Maximilian Colby tries to outdo St. Ignatius in his competition. He's, he changes it, says, I don't want to do it for the greater glory. I want to do it for the greatest glory. So, and I, I think he, maybe he did. Maybe he passed 
St. Ignatius. There's this rivalry between the two saints and trying to outdo each other uh, to impress Our Lady, kind of like the way um, maybe the Army and Navy football teams play or how any, any men try to compete and want to outdo each other. And so I, I really believe um, we, we will give God the greatest glory that we can do um, by doing the consecration. Um, he says this, um, let me find the quote. Um, he says this in paragraph 151. Um, it's because of our weakness. We don't know because we have a little bit of self-interest. Um, we don't know where God's greater glory is. He says on the bottom of page 80 or paragraph 151, either we do not know where the greater glory of God is to be found. Like sometimes we just don't know what it is we ought to do that will give God the greatest glory, or we do not wish to find it. If we're honest, we don't want to. We hold back we're with our self-loves. We either don't want to or we don't know. Um, but our Blessed Lady, to whom we see the value and merit of our good works, knows most perfectly where the greater glory of God is to be found. And so the reason why we're giving God greater glory in what we do is because we're not you know, deciding the value and the merits of it. We've given it to her. It's no longer ours. And so she is taking it and making it for God's greatest glory, which is just we've given it to her. And because we've given it to her, we don't have to figure it out. Maybe we'll never know or we'll see it unfold in our before our eyes. But if we've given it to her, then we know without a doubt 125 percent that the value of this rosary or this penance the satisfaction of it will be for god's greatest glory because we've given it to her she who is a perfect servant of, of god and will table will apply it to where she knows will be for his greatest glory and the fifth motive out of 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 why to do the consecration is it increases our unity with our Lord. We will become more united to Jesus. This is where this whole idea of to Jesus through Mary comes about. Um, and it really is. Like if we go back and look again, we don't have to pull this book out again, but on page 196, it's a consecration ultimately to Jesus through Mary. Jesus again is the is the ultimate end of our true devotion, and we're going to Him through Our Lady, um, and this true devotion has four characteristics of how, and I'll probably spend the rest of our time today talking about this, how this is the most, um, the best way. Um, he says this devotion is an easy, it's the easiest way. To, to Mary, to Jesus through Mary. It's the shortest way. It's the most perfect way. And it's the secure way. And this goes back to a conversation that I had with Brad the Greater when I was driving, um, just or maybe on the phone, just how, and you're going to see this in your own life if you haven't seen it. And you're going to see it also in the apostolate that you do as a father and a husband and in the apostolic work that you do there in um, Iowa and Wisconsin, you're going to see people around you that are making this consecration. And you're going to see them travel decades of hardship and suffering and, and cover ground that would take decades in less than a year. I've seen this so many times you're going to see people cover so much ground so fast they're going to be running and sprinting to jesus and mary so fast because 
Nary is making it happen so fast. Like, I can't tell you how many people I've seen skip decades of hardship in months, less than a month, like both in the Philippines and in the United States and in my own life. I'm going to see that, I know for sure, as I get to know you and, and um, I can all come back again, um, probably in the day, uh, whenever, whenever we decided, whenever we decide, uh, Brad, I don't remember, but. Uh, it's February of 24, I believe. So. so in a while, maybe I'll come sooner. That's, that's a great time to come up there to Wisconsin, you know. Yeah, middle of winter. Yeah, yeah. we don't need to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to see it. I just know it. I have literally no doubt. Like, I believe this 125%. Um, I've seen it in my own life. Just, um, just skip ground uh, fast. So let's go over this. It's an easiest way. It's the shortest way. It's the most perfect way. And it's, it's the most secure way to Jesus um, through Mary. First of all, it's the easiest way. <clears throat> it sounds like too good to be true. Does that mean I won't have the cross? No, but maybe you'll have less crosses than you would have had. Or if you still have hard crosses, our lady is going to give you candies. She's going to make it sweet. She's going to make, and I've experienced this, where I've experienced great suffering, emotional or spiritual suffering, where she's there with me, helping me, embracing me, loving me, hugging me, making the cross so easy, so sweet, um, such a joy. Um, yeah, um, there's many crosses we... Uh, uh, get because of temporal punishment, don't we? I always use the example when I teach high school students, if they like, when I was 16, I didn't really give my life to Our Lady uh, or to Jesus till I was like 18. If I would have died uh, when I was 16 or 17 or 15, I would have gone to hell thousands of times over. And anyway, um, think of those times where you got drunk and you just were, you had to hang over the next day and you had that suffering. That's a suffering of temporal punishment because of your sins. And there's many crosses that we are given because of our self-love, even from venial sins or just selfishness. Um, a lot of those will be lifted, but um, sometimes God wants us to embrace greater crosses because he wants us to grow in greater union with him. And, um, even if you're given greater crosses, um, she makes them easier and sweeter. And I have a great uh, quote to read to you. He says this, I believe that a person who wishes to be devout and to live piously in Christ Jesus and consequently to suffer persecutions and carry his cross daily will never carry great crosses or carry them joyously or perseveringly without a tender devotion to Our Lady, which is the sweet meat and confection of crosses. She makes the cross sweet and easy. Just as a person would not be able to eat unripe fruits without a great effort, which he could hardly keep up unless they had been preserved in sugar. So Our Lady, um, makes even great crosses easier um, because we're with her. Like we're not alone. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. Just like hugging her, we're hugging Jesus. Sometimes the cross can be so like the physical, the, not physical necessarily, but just emotional or spiritual crosses can be so great or the burden can be so that you want to hug a crucifix or the statue of her lady. And so I, I don't know if you do that, but I do that. Like hug her statue and it will make it so much easier. Hug it until it persevered till you feel the joy, the sugar, the, the candies. She gives, she will, if you persevere in it, she will give you her joy, her love. You'll know it, uh, you'll know her. 
and that maternal love. She um, says this in Guadalupe to, to St. Juan Diego, am I not here? Am I not your mother? You know, <laughs> she really loves us more than we can imagine, more than we even know, more than all the mothers in the world combined. And she um, will never abandon us when we're on the cross. Even if we have to carry great crosses, she will make it easy and make the bitterness, the bitter, bitter cross sweet. It's also a short way. It's a narrow way. We don't, we just think of all the avenues and the dead ends in the spiritual life that you will not have to take because of the consecration. She'll save you from all of those dead ends, all that wasted time, all of it. You will advance much faster in your union with Jesus. You will become more of who you are, whatever your spirituality is, whether you have a contemplative spirituality like St. John of the Cross, or like St. Therese, or like St. Um, St. Teresa of Avila, whether you have a spirituality like St. Ignatius of Loyola, where Jesus is your commander, and you really are just, your spirituality is meditative. You will go fast on that path of your spirituality without the, the distractions and the dead ends. Um, you, will, you will run and sprint to Jesus and Mary quickly without all that wasted time. It will save decades of time. I promise you, you will find, um, you will get our virtues faster. You know what your weaknesses are. You know which of the deadly sins is your great Achilles heel. The devil knows it too. And you will get our virtue, her virtues faster. Um, if you um, find your attachments, you will give those to her and focus on the greatest attachment that you have. And um, if you do, you will turn in that, you will turn towards her quicker and faster. And she will give you her virtues um, to do that. I just, I know this, like I've seen it so many times. I'm speaking from just lived experience in my own life, uh, doing the, the consecration three or four times a year and seeing so many people, just, it's amazing. Like I see people um, in the Philippines that have gone from just suffering from confusion because in the Philippines, the people are pious, but the priests are deep in a modernism and into the Pacham, the, the uh, Pachamama um, false church of darkness and all of that, what it means, where the priests plant trees as an act of devotion and not hear confessions, where they're more about all of that stuff. And the, the people don't know better. They, they've been in, immersed in that. And all of a sudden, they, they tell me, I don't want to receive communion on the hands anymore. And they're starting to enter into the mystery of the true faith and they become traditional Catholics, even though they don't have shepherds that even live that out or, or anything. You know, it's really, it's just because Our Lady, um, she purifies. That's why uh, I think one of the, the geniuses of what our, the Lord, our Lady doing with the confraternity of Our Lady Fatima is it can supercharge an apostolate because Our Lady is a crusher of heresies. And if you... Um, if you get people to encounter and make the consecration, a lot of the problems and errors and erroneous ideas that people have, Our Lady will just um, uh, remove, you know, so without you even having to talk about it. It's a, it's a perfect way. Um, what does St. Louis de Montfort mean by that? It's a perfect way because if there was a better way, then the Holy Trinity would have done it. If there was a better way, 
that Jesus, if Jesus would have taken one year off of his consecration to Our Lady, or 15 years off, and have spent those 15 years and spent uh, 18 years in public ministry and worked to convert the whole world and worked a million more miracles, then he would have done it, but he didn't do it. If there was a more perfect way, then he would have done it. And so, but he didn't. So there is no better way. He says this. Make it. That's why um, I have to be careful when I say this. But you will find, I believe, if has anybody ever made the consecration uh, to Our Lady according to Father Gately? Now, I don't want to offend you, but. You're going to find when you hold the true devotion of St. Louis de Montfort, which speaks about the true devotion, you hold it against Father Gately's. I'm sorry. No offense to Father Gately. No offense to the people that have made it. You will find that it is inferior to, and I say that, some people are going to get mad, but I don't care. You're going to find that St. Louis to Montfort's true devotion is way a thousand times better. Um, and he says this. Um, now something, and I'm not going to compare this to St. Maximilian Colby's. It's just different. I've made that one before. What I say about that is um, if you did it, you're going to be blown away. But you don't have a program. It's more informal. Um, you kind of just do it. There's no days or program. And so in that sense of the word, you kind of just have to do it. And um, it's a little, but it's still beautiful. But you don't have like 33 days. St. Louis de Montfort says this. Make for me, if you will, a new road to go to Jesus. Pave it with the merits of the blessed, like with all the merits of the saints that have ever lived. Adorn it with all of their heroic virtues, illuminate it, embellish it with all the lights and beauties of the angels, and let all the angels and the saints be there themselves to escort, defend, and sustain those who are ready to walk there. So you've got all the merits of the saints, all their virtues. You've got all the angels' lights, and the angels are escorting you, escorting you on this new road. And are ready to take you there. And he says, and yet in truth, in simple truth, I say boldly, I repeat that I say truly, I would prefer to this new perfect path, the immaculate way of Mary. So if you, even if you took everything of all the saints that ever lived, you took all the, the lights of the angels and made this new way, I would just, I would chuck that in the garbage and still walk this way. There is no better way. If there was, God himself would have done it, but he didn't. You're never going to prove upon this. So it kind of sounds, goes back to that conversation where I had with you, where my wife always says, everything you're doing is always the best. Everything is better. And you're arrogant, Christopher. And all that is true. I am arrogant, but it, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I am arrogant, but this is the best way because God himself did it. I don't think I'll convince my uh, my wife of um, 29 years uh, that there's a difference here. So uh, I'll save my breath. Uh, finally, it's a secure way. Um, sometimes we'll feel this. It goes back to... Um, but we have to be honest um, as we run to Jesus and Mary and sprint to them we're going to be attacked by Satan we'll be opposed um, and that shouldn't lead to our pride that should only lead to our humility because we're so darn weak we love ourselves so darn much and we're so weak that we're such easy prey uh, to, to the devil um and, and so we will be opposed as we grow closer in union with Jesus and Mary. 
Um, it could be if you run um, that you'll be persecuted by the church and by the state. You could be poisoned by St. Louis de Montfort. The devils could really go after you and really work uh, to you, work against you. They can manifest themselves um, in ways or at least make you feel darkness and empty and alone and cold and not have feelings of devotion at all. All that's normal. But um, we do have Our Lady's protection. And we, because we've run to her, we place ourselves under her veil. Her veil is so powerful. It protects the whole city of Constantinople. The Eastern Catholics um, have a devotion to her veil. In 1067, I believe, the whole city of Constantinople was being attacked, I think, by the Muslims. They prayed to her, and they have this devotion to her, Our Lady of Protection, to her veil. And so we're children, and we can run to Our Lady. We can run to Mama Mary, just like a little kid runs. You think, you, you see a two-year-old, <laughs> whenever any stranger comes, they run to their mama quickly because they know that's the only safe place. And so if we have that kind of faith, the faith that we must have that Jesus talks about to go to heaven, we run to her and place ourselves. There is no fear. Our Lady is the most powerful exorcist. Every entire victory and destruction of Satan passes through Our Lady. So much so that again, I'll repeat it again, that the devils are, they are afraid of the words, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Father Gabriel Morth says those words, you can see what the devil does in response to that is probably more powerful than the commanding prayers themselves of the right of exorcism because they are the words of the mother of God. That's why he he says it. He says it, if you watch, he's trying to provoke and get a battle going on in that video. The devil and Godfather Gabriel Morth, every time in the right of exorcism, he tries to provoke, he tries to start the fight. It's, it's amazing when you watch it, when you see Father Gabriel Morth, you see a man not confident in himself. You see a man who has perfect trust as a warrior, as a child, who knows that the fight is Our Lady's. And you see him trying to start the fight against that devil. And so he tries to get him aroused by, by provoking him, by saying, my soul proclaim, proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And you can see the devil provoked and angered and cursed and can't stand uh, hearing those awful, uh, horrific words. And so uh, when the devil goes after us, and he will in whatever manifestation, even though we feel all alone, dark and cold, and we feel like we can't move forward in this devotion. We simply hug the statue of Our Lady, hug the crucifix, um, hold the rosary in our hands, go to bed with the rosary in our fingers, um, make a visit, whatever it is, just simply make a union with Our Lady, saying, you are my heart and my soul, whatever it is, then we have complete confidence. There is no fear. There's perfect confidence that she has been given the victory. The devil cannot. She's storing up these treasures, the merits, the things that we truly earned for our salvation. She's storing those up and protecting them and keeping them safe. What, what is our alternative? 
our, our alternative is to not do the consecration. Now that we know to not let her store up our treasures, to not let her protect our merits. And what does that alternative look like? What are our odds of being, of going to heaven without her? It's crazy. It's a crazy thought. It's absolutely madness. Like we have only one option and that is to turn to her and let her protect us. And I promise you, and I believe this, I've experienced it in my own life. When we're tempted with great, evil, disgusting, vile, hideous uh, temptations, she's right there. And those temptations happen so that we can give more glory to God, so that we can grow in great strength. And she's uh, very full aware of what's happening and whatever of the seven deadly sins that it, the devil is trying to go after us. Her virtue is through there to supply. And, and that uh, thing, that evil is being purged off of us. It needs to be purged in this life or it will be purged off in purgatory. Our Lady of Fatima, um, uh, the little children asked Our Lady of Fatima a lot of questions like, what about so-and-so? Uh, um, you know, what's going on with them? You know, oh, this person's in heaven. But then they asked about this one person. I forget her name. Our Lady of Fatima. I think it was in the June or July apparition. Our Lady of Fatima said that birds, that soul, that girl will be in purgatory until the end of the world. And I thought everybody wants to know what did that dear person do? Because they want to understand what purgatory is. But it really shows um, purgatory is real. Um, we really have to be perfect. Um, and so we want the virtues of Our Lady so that we can we, we can go to her. When we die, what is, what is it we want to see? For me, I want to see Our Lady smile. I want her to be happy with me. I want her to, I want the smile of my mother. I want to see her. I want her to be proud of me, proud of her son. I just want to, I want her to embrace me and bring me in to heaven. But to do that, I must die in a state of grace. I must be free of temporal punishment. I must be perfect. And, uh, and I, that can only happen through this path of satisfaction that we talked about last time. So we'll close with that. It's secure. Let's see if we got a quote for you on that. Um, uh, we got a bunch. Paragraph 167. Here's the other thing. Uh, I, I really need to spend one minute on this. She, is the, she has been given the power of a heresy. And so he promises us that if we fall into error, error, it will never be because of our choice. We will never fall into formal heresy. If we do believe an error, it's because of our weakness. But we have assurance that under this consecration that we will never become a formal heretic. She will protect us in our way of thinking. There are so, think about this. Think of how many possible ways we can fall into error today. We don't have a Pope who exercises the office of teaching and he uses and abuses his office, not in a formal capacity, because that would be impossible for him to teach ex cathedra um, de fide truths, but he abuses night and day. He abuses everything of the Petrine office to destroy the church. All of his appointments are homosexuals, and just about every one. He brings the Pachamama as the vicar of Christ into the mother church, into St. Peter's. He gets a blessing from the grandmother of the West. He carries Gandalf's staff in the Amazon jungle. He carries the staff and replaces the crozier with the warlock's staff. He 
uh, teaches very in a confusing way um, that you can be an adulterer and receive Holy Communion. He says that if you are a Catholic, you're rigid, all of these things. So some people are worried that he's not the Pope. It is Bishop Schneider's opinion that he is the Pope. Can you have a Pope who, has a her that who is a heretic? You can. Pope Honorius was a heretic Pope. Pope Liberius was a heretic Pope. And you know what happened to Pope Honorius after his pontificate? A council after him condemned him in his grave and anathematized him after. And so this Pope in the future will be declared a heretic Pope. But what are, there are many people that believe Pope Benedict's the Pope. And then there's people that are say the chair is empty. That's a big problem. To be a St. Vicantus is a dead end. That, that it, it's a crisis of faith that the church will prevail. Our Lady will protect us um, from heresy, from error. She will keep us and we will be given a special grace of enlightenment. That's why Bishop Snyder is, uh, I'm going to end on this point. It used to be said during the Aryan crisis when 99% of the church, including the Pope himself, who was a heretic, a semi-Aryan, used to be said, where St. Athanasius is, there is the church. There is the true faith. I personally believe, and I'm not saying this to flatter Bishop Schneider, but I personally believe you can say that where Bishop Schneider is, there is the church, there is the true faith. It, he has this special grace of enlightenment, of navigating these complicated issues of things like this. What do you do if the Latin mass is canceled in Wisconsin? Do the faculties of the priests, are they still valid to your confession on a regular basis? Bishop Schneider would say, yes, they are. I just asked him because every Latin mass community is, in, is on the radar of the Vatican. It's just a matter of time. They're slowly picking off the big ones one after a time. What do we do? Do we bow and obey an unjust law? No, we obey, we're actually obeying the true faith respectfully. And how do we do that? We do it respectfully. We still pray for our bishop and our pope in the mass. We pray that there'll be better times, that they will come to their senses, that they will convert, that they will not be heretics, that they will come back. But what do we do? We are actually moving into a very dark age where we have only conscience. We're priests. We're going to have to decide. We, as fathers and husbands, will have to decide, and we're going to have to do it with great humility, great enlightenment. And we have very little light, very few shepherds to guide us. Thank God we have Bishop Schneider, who is so humble, who is so balanced, who is very sober and very, he has a great gift. And what I'm trying to say to you today is, this consecration that you're doing is going to help you decide for your families and give you the light that you need so that even if you fall into error a little bit, you won't become a heretic. I say to the contest, for example, like the people that believe Pope Benedict is Pope, they're going to have trouble. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but Pope Francis has appointed two thirds of the bishops, you know, that's a fact. And there are people that believe the last Pope was Pope uh, Pius XII. 
if you believe Pope Pius XII is the last pope, how many bishops are valid according to Pope Pius XII in that mindset? I don't even know if there's one. Maybe there's one or two. You know, that's a big problem. That's a big dead end. If you if you hang your hat that Pope Benedict was the last pope, and we go on to Pope Francis, and then we go on to, that means only one-third of the cardinals can name the Pope in the next conclave. You're, we're in trouble very soon. And this Pope plays around with joking about resigning. He's not going to resign. He jokes around it to mock and denigrate and throw the papacy into the mud, but he's not going to resign. He's going to stay on, and he's got more work to do. They want to... Uh, they're after contraception right now. They're after uh, the celibate priesthood, which the West has kept alive. They've got many more plans left. So anyway, I said enough. Um, so be assured that the consecration will keep you um, as you as we go into this dark age. I mean, do you think we're going to get somebody better? After Pope Francis, maybe if the only hope is Jesus and Mary will intervene, and someday they will, we will have in the age of Mary a very holy Pope that will become the father of all of humanity, and we will be known for his holiness. But uh, realistically, I mean, we don't think in political terms, but um, it could be that we're still haven't reached the high point of the chastisement yet. And so we may have to go up more. The chastisement may have to go more before it gets better. And so we mustn't, uh, must arm ourselves with Our Lady through this consecration. Um, I've said enough. Let's, uh, anybody have questions or thoughts? I'm like seven minutes over already. <laughs> You're fine. I just want to say thanks, Christopher. This has been amazingly enlightening for me. It's yeah. much appreciated that you've taken time to oh. give these lectures. I've had a, a deep devotion to Mary before, but it's just what, what you said is, or maybe St. Louis of Montfort, that with Mary, never yeah. enough. there's never enough. But yeah. I'm certainly learned that over this time, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful for you taking the time to do this. Oh. Thank you. I, thank you. I, uh, I get more out of it. So. I get to do the consecration. Anybody have other thoughts or feedback or questions? I have one thought that if you guys don't mind. I have a very dear friend of mine that he's very intellectual, but he's become a state of a contest and you know he's become very bitter about the whole experience that we're having. The one thing, and I didn't even mean to uh, stump him a little bit, but I was just pointing out to the recent. Um, Eucharistic miracles that we have had in the church. And I said, look, if if you take the state of a contest position and you're saying that all of these bishops, priests are invalid, then why do we keep having Eucharistic miracles? Because these priests have to, you know, uh, say the words of, of uh, that leads to the transubstantiation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that, that's one thing that he didn't have an answer for. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, so I said, just, I was like, look, just meditate upon the recent miracles of, I mean, the Eucharistic miracles. You know, yeah. so yeah. If, if they keep happening, that means that the priests yeah. are valid. Yeah. We're just going through, you know, a dark time in the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, does he, is he saving a contest from Pius XII or, or Pope Benedict? Yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, how, um, well, where's the church? Where's, does he believe we're, we're not going to have any more popes until Jesus comes? I don't think he's gotten that far yet, but, you okay. know, so he, he couldn't explain, you know, um, why the Eucharistic miracles keep happening? I said, well, we need valid priests yeah. for that, you know, trans transubstantiation to occur. If we yeah. don't have valid priests, then when the priests are up there, like the Protestants, they 
when they uh, say the, the words of uh, consecration, yeah, they you know they say the wrong words. It, it doesn't yeah. happen. Right? Nothing they happens. Yeah. Part of the grand battle. Yeah. So um, just point if, if you're talking about state of a contest, point the way to the research. Yeah. Yeah. And, Thank uh, you for that. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of that before. They. It's, it's sad um, to think in political terms. We have a created the churches. We're going to learn how powerful the papacy is, how powerful the church is. through this eclipse of the church um, that we're experiencing right now. It's going to be, the reign of Mary will be great. It'll be a, just, it'll just, God is allowing this to happen um, to, to show his mighty power, and to show how great our faith is. Yeah. So, Christopher, you, you had mentioned just that Bishop Schneider had said, because this is something, you know, we're going into a dark time, he said, we're only going to have our conscience to lead us. And of course, our conscience can be misled. Uh, but it's something that I've been, and a lot of people in our Latin Mass community have been struggling with, is what happens if the bishop, or when the bishop says, no more Latin Mass. Can we go underground? Do we... Um, we place a priest in jeopardy of salvation of, because of disobedience if they if they will offer Latin mass for its underground. And, no, the, I guess. Yeah, there's no there. Are, so if you're a priest or a bishop, um, and your your faculties are removed, even if they declare you laicized, you are still a priest or bishop, and. What is going to happen is the same thing that happened with Archbishop Lefebvre. One day, Archbishop, Archbishop Lefebvre, according to Bishop Schneider, will be declared a saint in the church. He did not try to start a movement. It just came down to this. He was serving people that he felt in his conscience needed to be served. And he was being, um, he was being, um, uh, he was he was strictly being canceled for for doing what for celebrating the Latin Mass and for believing the true faith that he will believe for two thousand years, and so it's going to come down on a case by case basis. We don't need Bishop Schneider will be the first to say we don't need um, sectarian priests that try to build a cult around themselves, like 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 um, like um, there are some priests that got canceled. We don't want them to be too famous. They need to stay humble, stay to their true faith. They need Our Lady's protection. We need to pray for them um, and not be sectarian and build a following around themselves. At the same time, if you're a priest right there where you guys are, and all of a sudden the bishop says, you can't celebrate the Latin Mass anymore. That is unjust and actually obeying that is disobeying the faith. It's disobeying the tradition. St. Augustine and St. Thomas say an unjust law is not a law. So if you, if the priest obeys that, he's actually disobeying. And, and he, he may feel in his conscience that these people's salvation may be at stake. They may, may not be shepherded. Where are they going to go? You know, like in Steubenville, 700 people go to the Latin Mass every Sunday. What are those 700 people going to do? The priests, I can't say what those priests are going to do, but that's 700 people, the souls that need to be saved. And so Bishop Schneider would say, keep celebrating the mass, support the priests. Are their confessions valid? I, I could show a screenshot. It. He says, of course, their confessions are valid. It fits under the law of supply. And the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dark time. Who wants to be a Catholic or priest wants to be in that situation? It's not normal for us. It's not Protestant to be like this. We pray for the Pope. If the Pope comes to us, we still genuflect before him, kiss his ring. If the bishop comes, we still genuflect, kiss his ring as if they're Christ. But we don't, we don't, they're the, as bishops and I would say they're Pharisees. We, we show them respect, but we don't. We don't follow their example. We don't obey. We don't obey them when they ask us to do unjust things. They are not in danger of salvation at all. 
Archbishop Lefebvre, let me repeat it again. Bishop Schneider believes Archbishop Lefebvre one day will be declared a saint. That that means his his excommunication actually was not one. It seemed like it was, but it it wasn't one because what he did was what he needed, but wasn't conscious what he needed to do. And unfortunately, the the powers that be are making us all confronted. A father's gonna have to decide, do I go to a clown mass or do I drive two hours to go to a Latin mass? What do I do? If father wants to celebrate Latin mass, he needs to go underground because now he's, he's quote unquote been laicized do I support him? Is he a priest? These are all things that we're going to have to ask. So, I'm way over time. Anybody else have thoughts or should we go? And forget us our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And to the of the King, who is now on the channel, the world of all men. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, 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 pray